Ladies and gentlemen, we have the incredible Amir Sultani with us, a graphic novelist, documentary filmmaker, and human rights activist. He is the co-creator of Zara's Paradise, a New York Times bestselling graphic novel, published as an interactive real-time webcomic. Zara's Paradise is a fiction based on the true story of an Iranian woman whose son vanishes after the 2009 protests against Iran's fraudulent elections. Zara's Paradise was nominated for an Eisner Award and has been translated into 16 languages. Amir has worked in business, media, nonprofits, and philanthropy. He is the executive producer and co-director of Dogtown Redemption, which we were just watching, a documentary film about recyclers in West Oakland. Welcome, Amir. Thank you so much, Pierjan. I'm actually here with my dog, Louie. Oh, Louie, yes. And I love that the, <laughs> the bios all mention Louie. So we, <laughs> we can't forget Louie. And what we, were, what we were just watching, Dogtown Redemption, is such an incredible story. And for me, both Dogtown and Redemption, they have this commonality. And I know that you talk about grief and trauma in Zara's paradise, but also the connection with love. But love seems the biggest thing that I get from Amir Sultani, that you really contain multitudes and this ability to really be so empathetic to connect and then to hear stories and go into them. And so, I know that for Zara's Paradise, you were sort of finishing the book as this was also being made at the same time. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. So I'd run out of money for the film, which happens often, and uh, took a job which brought me to Utah. And um, I was always thinking that, okay, the job will finance the film. And it so happened that I was also, um, you know, uh, I sent in a proposal to um, make a, a, for a graphic novel called Ahmadinejad's Diaries. And it was supposed to be the former Iranian president who was kind of a little outlandish, absurd. And so I was thinking, uh, you know, I was thinking of doing some, a spoof really. And it's, and it, and the Iran protests happened, the 2008 presidential election protests happened. And they hit me like a, you know, the way a tsunami kind of hits you just was so strong. So, so the film and the graphic novel were sort of happening in kind of strange ways together, uh, together with a job that I was trying to hold on to. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, th so they did, they were sort of um, on parallel tracks. Uh, the graphic novel came out earlier actually it started it later and it came out earlier than the film the film was a seven-year project a little bit longer actually and i can see they both um, lent themselves to one another because you've you've talked about how the graphic novel is this different type of art form and you sort of had to master it and it was easier than using a camera because you didn't have oh, goodness. to think about a camera <laughs> <laughs> but in this case with Dogtown Redemption, you're always having to think about the camera and, you know, were you going with all these camera operators everywhere into all these locations and, and, and how did you build trust with them to be able to do that? Sure. I mean, I wasn't a filmmaker and I still don't think of myself as one um, because I'm not technical, as you just saw with the panic over the Zoom call. I'm just not technical. It's like it's not a, or or at any rate, you know, I I don't think in terms of technology. Um, I think in terms of story. And so um, when you know, in, as far as building trust was concerned, I mean, with a, with anything that's worth anything, I, I think the greatest resource is time. Um, and presence and togetherness. So, you know, initially I was living in my brother's condo. I'd moved to West Oakland and the condo was, you know, I'm, you know, I, I was very, the condo was built above a converted schoolhouse. 
and um, the condominiums were close to the recycling center, um, you know, Alliance Metals. And, you know, initially I was just, I just arrived in California. I was completely disoriented myself. And the only connection I really had to the streets was the sound of the shopping cart early in the, you know, either late at night or early in the morning. It was, or even the sight of it. And it's kind of eerie, you know, um, you look out of your window and it's kind of foggy and all you see is a shopping cart. You know, shopping carts belong in the, they're the ultimate consumer thing, right? And yet entire, they contained entire lives. And it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just shopping bags and I mean, recycling and stuff. It was just lives inside them. And, you know, it was just always on the periphery, always on the periphery. I'm a child of privilege and, um, you know, I, I've experienced displacement as an Iranian who's come to America and, you know, had to figure things out, but not poverty um, on the scale that I was exposed to. Um, you know, you would put your trash outside and within, I don't know, maybe an hour or two, seven or eight people would come and go through the trash. And I remember looking through the window on this rainy day and a young woman was sort of looking through into the trash and just going deeper and deeper into the trash can. And, you know, in Iran, where I'd grown up in my grandmother's house, there was more of a sense of osmosis between the house and the street. You kind of knew who was going by and who wasn't going by. And, you know, you there was a culture of, there was a different culture around food. And, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, the donkey would come by even and, you know, sell watermelons and things. It was, there was a, I don't know, there, there was, there was air. You could breathe. Um, but looking through the condo window, the second floor, even though physically, like the distance between, you know, where you put your trash and the, the boundaries of the property, it's just, I don't know, 20 centimeters, you know, there was just no connection and no communication. And just this, you know, silence as if I was the window myself, you know, and I, so, and, and, and it took a minute, you know, it took a minute that, you know, I was going into San Francisco, working as a journalist, coming back home, doing the Middle East, because all that mattered in my head was the Middle East. And I'd never really forged um, my entire creative professional educational work was on the loss of Iran and the consequences of the revolution. And that was, those were the stories that just blinded me, continued to blind me. That was the trauma, if you will. And, um, you know, I'd studied a lot of history. I'd done a lot of social history, you know, and I was very interested in where you look at the world from, co our conceptions of time and what matters and what doesn't matter and where we turn our attention. So I'd, I had the training of a historian or a social historian. But I dropped out of Harvard. I hated Harvard. I hated the way ideas were detached for me from life and emotion and imagination. I'd hate the, I hated the professionalization of disciplines. And I was a gadfly. I wanted to do art. I wanted to tech. Anyway, all of this stuff. But it was this. So, so it, it took a minute for me to you know, and I just didn't feel American. I'd never felt American. I don't know why, but I was this, you know, you know, kind of like the Russian exiles in Paris who forever are living in the past and are not engaging where they're at. Kind of the way you've engaged the barbershop, actually. I just finished watching your film. And, um, and so, you know, Eventually, somebody came down the street, um, named, his name was Jefferson, and he was half paralyzed, the street, like pushing the shopping cart with one hand 
coming through and went started going through our trash. And I went down and met him. And we started a conversation. I started helping him with the bottles and stuff. And walked down the street to the recycling center. And, you know, because I worked in San Francisco, I'd never really... Like, even though the recycling center was just like, I don't know, 500 meters away or, you know, not too far away, I'd never physically experienced it. I just, you know, you experienced the world through the car or whatever. I just, I just hadn't experienced it. So I went in and the experience was like being on a Fellini set. I mean, it was just mesmerizing. The energy and the creativity and the buzz and the connection and the community and the yelling and the screaming and the joy and all of this stuff and it was just suddenly i don't know why but it was mine you know it, it felt like my my work i found my world and my i don't know something so it's you know and, and of course at first it was just small conversations i think you know, I think at the heart of any, you know, listen, watching your film and other films, I mean, what's so beautiful about life is our ability for exchange, whether it's the exchange of cans or ideas or whatever. And that place was a really extraordinary, in a way, commodities market where people were bringing in aluminum and glass and plastics with all these prices shifting and so on. Anyway, so I just started hanging out there and meeting people and speaking with people, um, including Landon, who's one of the characters. I met, you know, I left the house one day at midnight and walked to the recycling center, and there he was sleeping at the gate. And we started a conversation, and he said to me, you know, I woke him up almost, and he's, you know, and the, you know, his voice was just so beautiful. And the silhouette as I was talking to him, I was lying down on the ground next to him, filming and speaking. And he started telling me, Amir, do you know the origins? He started speaking about drug. And he said, do you know the origin of the word? And I'm like, no. And he said, well, the Latin is ph pharmacopoeia and so on. So, you know, that conversation got going. And then Jason came with all of his stuff. And he was like the Olympic titan of recycling so that conversation kept going you know all these different conversations and so you know i wasn't thinking of myself as a filmmaker i was just sort of thinking that this is you know this is uh this is uh i don't know i was just feeling the connection to this world um and so the trust was really a function of conversations and when we introduced the camera it was actually quite problematic. First of all, because I didn't know how to film, and it was a whole, you know, goodness, light, sound, mics, this, that, the other. It was just like, oh, you know. And then, and then it was also the intimacy can diminish, especially if you go in with a big camera. And in you know, in West Oakland, where there has been this whole history of racism and, you know, West, o West Oakland is the birthplace of the Black Panther. I mean, it has a storied history. It was the place where the first African-American um, labor union corporation really gets established. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary location with a lot of history behind it. Um, and so, so, but but when you just went in with the camera, people were so used to, like, to become visible was to be endangered in West Oakland. It's the opposite, if you will, of Hollywood, where everyone, where being visible was a threat because you were always police cameras and surveillance cameras and home cameras and, you know, people being, being you know, all of that stuff. So, so it took a lot of conversations and it took a lot of time before we started taking the camera in and you know people knew us and then the people who were being filmed were telling other people about the film and you know the trust got built quite slowly and I love that uh, you know I love slow 
um, I didn't know how much I loved Slow until we started, which is why the film took as, you know, I was watching you making your, you know, I was watching your films and, you know, Iranian parents, right, aren't used to having filmmaker sons. I like, or you dropped <laughs> yeah, out of Harvard absolutely. to make a yeah. film about a recycling center and you don't know even how to film. Like, what the hell? And so they're always asking me, when is it going to be finished? And I never knew. I was always saying, oh, it'll almost, almost, almost. And I honestly went in thinking that, you know, it's three months, $10,000, and I'll be free. I will have done, you know, I will have explored. But, but as you ask the questions and as the t lives uh, open up before you, the the story deepens. And ultimately, your loyalty is to the story, it has to be to the story. And so, like, you know, like, I would occasionally just go get so frustrated that I'd want to, you know, like when you're on a train, you want to pull down the brakes and just, just get the hell out of, jump out of the plane, train. But the train just kept on going. And I just knew, you know, just the story has its own life and its own energy. And I think the beauty the film is that that you don't know where you're heading that you're you're like a river and the stream it'll take you know the consciousness is much greater than your own and as you encounter that greater consciousness it kind of eventually starts to guide you in beautiful ways as well so 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 well i what i really want to say sorry to be so long-winded but what I really want to say is that, especially stories that involve trauma, um, the gift that you bring to them is time. Um, for instance, you in the barbershop again. I just finished watching. I haven't even actually, I have another 20 minutes left. But, you know, you are nine years old or very young. And you re revisit that 40 years later. And this it was the same for many of the characters in our story. It's like, why are you who you are at this point in time? And it would invariably take people back in their, in their histories. And the same thing with the recycling center. It too had a history. And the same with West Oakland. It too had a history. And then the art of making the film became one of how do you weave these three stories together? And I had pitch battles with my uh, partner on the film, Chihiro. I brought him on, on board as director of photography, but eventually because I'd moved to Utah, I had to make him producer and co-director and king and queen and you know all of these things. And he strongly, he was a romantic and he, str he strongly wanted to tell the story of the characters. He's like, why do we have to tell the story of the recycling center? or the story of West Oakland. But I was more of a social historian and I was very much interested in, in context. I think context is so important to story. And I felt that the individual stories didn't allow the context to speak and the context mattered. So, so it took me years to actually understand what West Oakland was, what that space was, how did I find myself? And really, it was about me trying, part of it was also about me trying to, I, I realized this later, me trying to sink roots in, you know, I had failed to connect to America through Harvard and the elitism of that place, even though, you know, it was like, oh, well, you know, and, and I really needed to connect much more deeply with a place that I could truly claim as my own little piece of the world, like that barbershop again, you know, it's like the barbershop in the recycling center. So, so that's how this story started. That's how the trust got built. And it's just amazing. And, um, you know, it makes me think when you talk about the context and the partner that wanted to focus on character rather than doing the context, that's actually what for me, in both uh, Zara's Paradise and Dogtown Redemption, I thought what made it this prism 
this sort of refracting diamond, this Rashomon of experience where we got so many perspectives and between all those perspectives, we could delineate some type of truth or real understanding from it. And in particular, at least, I mean, I'll get into Zara's Paradise in, in a second, but for Dogtown Redemption, what I thought was very, very unique, and if you could talk a little bit about it, and I know you said tech, technical-wise, it was difficult, but there is this incredible brilliance that you did not sync the audio <laughs> necessarily with the image at, at all times and that whole opening and that's why i i showed the opening before you came so that everyone could see that we have this sort of collage of voices and the voices come in you know we have robert kennedy then we have the other voices and slowly we're getting this whole variety of people and it's not just the folks that are for Alliance Metal, it's those that are against Alliance Metals. And, and then it becomes a real space because of it, you know? So how much of this audio uh, play were you aware of? And was that something you did right from the get-go that you knew you, it was gonna be this audio oh. thing? And was it connected to that shopping cart sound or? No, Hughes. I mean, I mean, obviously, the shopping cart sound, that sound was, I, I find the same thing with Dogtown. I think that for me, um, music, creativity, film, everything, sometimes you have to listen very deeply for that opening note. You know, it's like, it's like what opens the movement. And once you hear it, once you hear it, you know, like you know that that's that 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 that's that sound is what takes me, takes you in, you know, and it was really strange because, you know, the, so obviously it was the sound of the cart that almost, 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 um, you know, when you hear it night after night, and and you're in bed, and someone's outside. And it's dark, and it, or it's cold, or it's whatever, and you're not going down and opening the door, and saying, "My darling, how are you?" Oh, that's so hard to ignore. I mean, for me, anyway, as maybe it's my Iranian side, but it's to ignore that someone that close to you is suffering that intensely and you are not making the effort your your absence you're not present before them i mean i think this is the empathy piece of maybe it's from iranian culture i don't know but it's very um it's painful you know it's not that the person out there it's like your numbing of your own need to be present before other human beings is a very painful thing to do, you know? And um, so so it was very interesting because with Zahra's Paradise, it was the graphic novel that I worked on. You know, I knew that I'm going to tell the story of Iran, but the opening of Zahra's Paradise, which is this scene where dogs are being drowned in a river, that opening note was from my childhood when I was, I don't know, nine or 10, again, back to your barber. And I remember, you know, again, I was a child of privilege. Our driver was outside waiting to pick me up from school. Somebody kicked my ball over the thing. The ball had rolled down. He'd gone to fetch the ball and he comes up and he tells me, um, you know, I saw this, you know, I saw this person down there with a gunny sack full of puppies that they were about to drown in the river. And I just, you know, I don't know, 30 years later, I'm thinking of Zahra's Paradise and that gunny sack surfaces, you know? And, that, and in that experience of the gunny sack, everything is captured. You know, the experience of the dogs disappearing, the experience of prison, 
the experience of space and time as a coffin in which you, you know, so all of it was there. And I didn't know, you know, so I'm just saying that, that I think for the creative thing, it's like, it's something that, in my case, it seems that it's something that disturbed me, you know, that disturbed a sense of balance or, or whatever it was. And it just registers somewhere. And then when you want to engage it, it almost comes out like the hoopoe in the Conference of the Birds, you know, in, in Atar's work. And that point, that kid, that wound, that shock, whatever, that you didn't confront properly, presents itself as your guide to the story that you're going to share, you know. And I, again, because I just watched your film and it's all so fresh and and I loved what you'd done so much. But that night, you know, that little kid, the shots of that kid on the grass, wondering with his eyes open. And, you know, it's like this, the, this loss of innocence that you experienced, you know, or this, this, this you know, and, and I think it's just part of human life. But I, um, I think it, I think when you go back to it, when you want to start on something, when you want to start on a project, it really helps to find that, it find that hoopo, that point, that point through which light will break through. But before I continue, is is the conversation between the six of us? Am I correct? I'm, I'm seeing six six screens here. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I was gonna share a bit of uh, some images from Zara's Paradise, and then just open it up to anybody that and, have questions. But I just wanted to say that I would love to know, you know, if um, Saravine and Dojanya, Kazinia, and Hong would like to tell me just a little bit about themselves. Mm -hmm. I'd I like to be in conversation. So you know, we'll follow your. You're the hoopo. You're the hoopo. So guide us. But um, I'd love to know and meet and chat and so on. Yeah, we can we can do that. Um, uh, why don't why don't we do that now, and then we can see where it takes us and go back into Zara's paradise and, and continue on. Anybody want to uh, say hello and share a little bit about your presence, your being right now with Amir? And we also have uh, Dean Chang is here with us uh, from the, the Dean of the College of Arts and Media is also here. Very nice to meet you, Dean. Very nice to meet you too. Yeah, let others to start, please. Oh. I can go. Okay. Hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm Dejanae, I'm Dejanae Robinson. I'm actually originally from Oakland, California, born and raised. And I, so when, when I saw like your video, I immediately could tell that you captured the humanity. You captured the essence, you captured the whole story. And I personally appreciate that. Um, I am a, I'm going into my third year here at SIUC in the master's program for creative writing. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to I'm happy to meet you. Thank you very much. I'm so happy that we have an Oaklander with us. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go next. Mm -hmm. Hi. My name is Cassiana. I'm from Nigeria. I'm in my second year, MFA Theatre Directing. I'm so happy to be here. Your story is very inspiring. You know, before um, I came online, I was reading um, the week's um, lecture for this week, and I was reading about iOS, f-stops, and aperture, and I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I'll never be a filmmaker. I don't understand these things. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I went to film school like 12 years ago. And I've done some, I have some film credits, but when it comes to the technicalities of filmmaking, I'm always like, no, this is not me. So hearing you say what you said about you not being technical and focusing on storytelling, it was really, really suiting to me. Like, okay, this is someone that relates to my struggle. You know? <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for, for your wisdom and for sharing your experience with us. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Salam. Man Sarvina. Khosh umadin be kelasamu. Um, I'm also a second year fiction student. Um, <clears throat> but I'm doing multiple things. I write poetry. I write fiction. I create films after taking classes with uh, Piru's and um. I'm hoping to bring all of them in my thesis and write about what you actually talked about in your interview with BBC about how we can be home and where home is. So I was really wondering if, um, because that sentence that you said in that interview also struck me that even though I've been writing about home so much, um, that was, I never thought of myself as home when you, when you said that you saw your um you saw yourself as a home to your dog Louis and um so I was wondering if um after all the stories that you've already said if you would be willing to say the story of Iranians in diaspora or your own story being in it wow you you know talk about touching a nerve at the right <laughs> time you know um so for the past five years Five years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, of all things. Oh. Just didn't expect it. It just sort of left field kind of thing. And I think that I'd, um, you know, again, in um, Piers's film, uh, there is a there's a con <clears throat> conversation comes about what we hold in and what we share. And and I, I you know, I understood at some point that I felt that I turned my, myself into this like coffin for holding on to all the things and people that I loved and had would perished. And so all I was left with was really memory. And, um, and I, I couldn't, and because of all the, because of the depth of my love for all the, all the people that I'd lost, I somehow couldn't begin my own life. You know, it just, I didn't know where go was. I didn't know where, and, I, and in some ways I still don't. And I'm still, you know, it's, it's like, where does our life really begin? If, if It's like, how do you move forward if not with the past contained within you and honored through your life? Like how, like I almost feel that, I almost feel that we're, the, 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 you know, artists, filmmakers, and so on, in some ways we're like priests in that we're in this zone between the living and the dead always, or in conversations. And and that it can't be otherwise, really. It can't really be otherwise. So just like two days, so when Piru said to me, Amir, can you join my class? I was like, oh, I, I was taking my mom on this tour of California because she has she's been dealing with cancer issues and she really wanted to meet everyone while she's healthy. And so the last days was meeting my mom's aunt. My mom is 84. Her aunt was 94 and had dementia. So I'm like, oh goodness, all the stories that her aunt would tell me, they're gone. You know, she would smile at us, but this, you know, I just couldn't access that one. And then after her, we went to see my mom's cousin. Her name is Fahul Talo, Fahri. Mm -hmm. She's now 90. <clears throat> and in our family, she's been, you know, whenever you, she lives alone and she's going blind, but she's in her own house and her entire being is a lament to herself. So if you, when you, so everybody avoids her like the plague she's like this witch and you know and also you know she's like um she lives in this little little house near a freeway right so and it's like and only one eye sees so she's got the pictures of the entire family on one side but it stops like where the blind eye is anyway and i was like oh you know, because in part because since I've been a kid, I've been in this sort of 
you know, with the revolution, you're forced to be a caregiver all the time and a provider and everyone's wounded around you. And, you know, there's no time for breathing. It's like one person's sick and another person is dying. It's like my entire mindset has been, even with Dogtown, with Miss K has been like, but I want to make sure that the people I love leave this world with dignity. So I've very much been focused on exits, much more than entrances, if you will. And so we get to Fakhul Tala's thing, and I'm just dreading it. I'm like, okay, I just don't want to deal with this. And I go there, and there's like this explosion of history and memory and life in front of me. She was like, you know, she had pictures of herself from the 1960s. Like, she's 90 now, right? And those pictures, she's like Brigitte Bardot. I mean, she's like a holly, hot Hollywood star. And she's almost imitating Brigitte Bardot, you know? And, and she's, you know, and the stories start to flow. And I just find myself loving her so much, you know, just so feeling so much love for the witch of the family, you know, and she starts talking about, you know, how she became an anyway. So, so yes, Saravine, that family story is now presenting itself, but in a way I've also not wanted to be constantly telling stories like for the past five years I just abandoned the storytelling because it's it you know I just I was just tired like they take so much out of me when everyone that you do it really it's an offering after all I mean it's an I really do think of art as as a form of reverence and as a form of witnessing and as an offering and sometimes I just have nothing to offer, frankly. Um, and so, um, you know, I feel as though I'm coming back to life. And so the storyteller is beginning to make itself felt. Long answer. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, if I if I took you to a difficult memories. Can you repeat? I didn't hear you well. Sorry. Uh, I said sorry that I took you to difficult memories. I just no, no. You took me to joy. You, you took <laughs> me to joy. Actually, it's joy. It's not. Um, I think that I think in all of it, in you know, making Dogtown, the joy I had with Miss K and with Jason and with Landon, mm -hmm. it's unsurpassable because, you know, again I go back to Pierce's film because you i mean i think at the heart of any artistic endeavor that's of any value is profound vulnerability um and presence in before the human condition um and i i, I you know so there is absolutely no nothing to be sorry about and there's no i mean it's difficult but it's also that's why it's so full of joy it's kind of like, like, like this on mine. She's like a porcupine from the outside, and then inside is the gold. And you got to be willing to be let the porcupine in, <laughs> and mm. she will sting you. She will sting you. You will be stung many times in the process. But you know, mm. well, uh, I mean, it's so wonderful to see you here, meet you here. Although just the virtually and uh, all the other uh, wonderful individuals from our college at SIU, and really, really enjoy enjoyed the, um, the documentary I have seen uh, so far, and um, it's even more amazing. You share your uh, vivid and um, such caring and loving personal experience with all of us and of course I and this is truly amazing and um, I have um, I would like to learn more about how you make this happen how you came up with these ideas and how you 
overcome the, all the obstacles during this seven year long process. Wow, that's amazing. Seven year um, experience, um, uh, a long journey uh, for this documentary. Um, but uh, in particular, I'm so impressed and um, by your thought provoking comment that you made about the disconnection about the disconnection of uh, elite university and with the reality, the current, the contemporary America we are all living in. Your documentary truly humanizes um, a very important and but unique, very important, but often neglected uh, other part of America. You bring that to life and uh, shared that with the entire world. And I wonder, well, how as someone came to this country, I have, in that sense, I have a shared experience because um, I came to the United States 32 years ago. I'm originally from China. So it's uh, uh, United States is a great country, beautiful country, a strong country, and a lot of wonderful things here. But at the same time, has many other things surprising me, uh, surprising all us, and usually people don't pay enough attention to. So you carried that mission all these years, and. Um, um, with your expertise and the talent, you shared that with the nation and the world. I wonder how you keep that going, and that have that mission driven over the years. And at the same time, I'm wondering um, about your important question, how to best connect our academic experience when we are doing our everyday work, no matter teaching or other things in, at a university, no matter as at Harvard or at SIU, or for our students who have the opportunities to study here, but how to cultivate that care, that, that passion and that determination when they are here. And also how our, academic program and the curriculum, what we are doing every day can best really connect our the academia world with the real world. So that, that's something I found is fascinating and also very thought provoking. Thank you for raising that question. And then. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I. I mean, it's a very deep and long conversation, mm -hmm. but I think that, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I can't say I think this, you know, I, I think that what I experienced at Harvard was the 2009 protests in Iran were going on. Mm. And I would go to these chairs of Islamic studies or Persian studies, the authorities on everything. And it was not a concern for them. It wasn't their, they defined their field sufficiently narrowly that they weren't willing to engage with the, with the reality of Iran and the reality of the Middle East as it was working its way in front of us, you know. And, um, you know, I was being encouraged to work on medieval Islamic history as Iranian students and scholars were being <clears throat> taken to prison. And that's when I realized that I just don't be, I just didn't belong there because my, you know, my commitment was not to knowledge. I was not interested in knowledge, in generating knowledge for knowledge's sake. I wasn't interested in history for history's sake. I, you know, what I wanted was for knowledge to be infused with love and life and to be connect, connected to those. And I felt that I was being forced to become someone 
and to comply with disciplines and requirements that I couldn't accept that would that were defeating me as a person. They were, def you know, I, I, I was losing my voice. I was losing my imagination. There was no room for my voice or my imagination or my voice or my mm -hmm. care or my love in what I was doing. And it was a profound, I don't know, conservatism maybe or fear of controversy or, you know, all of these things. Um, you know, and because I, you know, anyway, so, 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 I mean, I think these are, I think the question, I mean, the question of the role and place of emotions mm -hmm. in, in the world of knowledge, in a world of knowledge that's defined by Aristotle, <laughs> supremacy of reason, mm -hmm. you know, the, the role of the place of emotion and the arts is very, anyway, so this is a very long conversation that I, um, you know, a critique, if you will that I think needs to happen at some point, because, you know, you look at universities with $40 billion endowments like Harvard's, <laughs> and, you know, you look at where the graduating class is going, which is to Morgan Stanley and so on, and, you know, Goldman Sachs, and, you know, and it just, and then you realize that, well, the universities have a, you know, universities also are perpetuating class in, class structures and things in ways that are um you know they, in ways that i didn't like let's put it this way so so i th you know i think the fact that you have a humanities and arts program I, you know i'm a great believer in the humanities and the arts mm -hmm. even though i was going for a phd in history so so that's that and then mm -hmm. cultivating care and love i mean i think when you come i mean i think that's I think we're human. I think it's there in everyone. I think, you know, when you when you create something that's meaningful, and you connect with people and you deepen community. I think when you make a film, like you, you know, there's the Oscars and the Emmys and all of these things. But ultimately, what you generate and what you're left with is a community. So I have, because of Zahra's Paradise and because of Dogtown, I have friends that I wouldn't have otherwise, mm -hmm. and uh, and we've made commitments to each other as people around projects that, you know, we didn't know if the film would see the light of day. I had no idea. I had no idea. I, the day, you know, it took seven years to make. I had an apartment in Belgium. I had to. I sucked at raising money. So I had to I sold that apartment and put half of the money into the film because editors are so expensive, you know, <laughs> or at least the editor that I had, you know, and it's just like, you know, you, you know, for about a year I had to pay about seventeen thousand dollars a month, and I was so tired of begging for money that I just sold the the damn apartment. <laughs> it was easier, <laughs> you know, and then. And, you know, obviously grants and everything came and financial support and all that stuff came. But um, I didn't know if anybody would, I didn't know if anybody would ever see the film. So I think all artistic projects are first and foremost acts of faith in the community that you're in and also in yourself and everything like that. But, you know, Miss Kay, who was one of the characters, have you guys seen Dogtown till the very end? No, so I don't want to ruin the film for you. But, <laughs> but at, you know, I found out, maybe if we have another conversation, I'll tell you this, but mm -hmm. in the most painful, one of the most painful moments of my life, where I was confronted with, you know, you're making a film, but it's a film about real people. And when you're confronted with their, with the deepest loss, in that very moment, I got news that, you know, Independent Lens was going to pick up the film. And so I knew that, wow, well, the film is will be seen. Like, it wasn't worthless what we did. And I was able to see someone on their deathbed and tell them that their story lives on and matters. And, you know, what more can you ask for, you know? 
And I think that, you know, for those of us who are in the creative world with streaming and, you know, capitalism and so on, I mean, you know, the, Hollywood is in a war with all the actors mm -hmm. and screenwriters over, you know, the studios are, you know, the control over story is being narrowed and the controls over stories are increasingly being restricted to very fewer and fewer outlets. And so we owe it to ourselves, not just to make films and not just to generate stories, but also to engage in the politics of who gets to tell their story, how and where. And so there's, you know, all, you know, so by making a film, having a product that you want to present to the world, mm -hmm. you're also forced to confront questions of power and marketing and distribution and all of those things. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, is really sad. I was, when I was in California, I learned that Street Spirit, which was the homeless newspaper, was being shut down because they couldn't raise $200,000 and um, to, to keep the newspaper going, which is what their budget was. And, you know, when you think about the amount of money that the Googles and all the other tech companies, like $200,000 is how much a single house in the Bay Area appreciates in a year because of the mm -hmm. how much money there is over there. And yet the little infrastructure that gives the homeless a voice isn't able to sustain itself right and so then you know these these bigger questions about where the country is going come into come into the thing and you know one of the things that so there was a network of news homeless newspaper vendors who were selling the homeless newspaper which was the platform through which we were challenging the city of Oakland and a lot of the power structure there. And so that newspaper is now closed, but just, you know, when the film came out, there was this question again of marketing and distribution. And so we um, basically distributed the DVDs of the film amongst the newspaper vendors um, for free and they were selling the newspaper for a dollar and they could sell the DVD for $10. So we started selling, you know, we created our own little distribution network. And, you know, I was just thinking about the collapse of the homeless newspaper today. And I was like, huh, I'm really glad I did that little pilot project. And I'm still sort of struggling again with, you know, these questions of power and knowledge and voice and you know what does it mean for you know what does it mean for poor people and lower income people in america to just get shoved us you know pushed further and further into margins i invited a friend for breakfast in the bay area mm -hmm. and it was just a you know average little breakfast an omelet a coffee and an orange juice for two people and it came to seventy dollars. Wow! I'm just saying, you know, that's how much inflation there is over there. So you just sort of, you know, seventy dollars, Jason, on a very good two day spree of recycling, exhausting recycling, would at most make hundred and fifty dollars. You know, and and so as the sources of income for the poor are being pulled back the you know the revenue streams being pulled back the inflation is going up and covid and all this stuff so you know it, these are tipping points these are dangerous tipping points and i think for those of us who are immigrants who've come to america need this country to be more than it at least what it claims to be we need its promise to be true because because of what we've seen other countries the way we've seen other worlds collapse it's you know you're very sensitive to these marginal um mic what um what Pierce calls microaggressions 
these are sort of micro financial aggressions and micro newspaper aggressions and micro thing and then and then before you know it it's that pine needle forest view is that you were talking about you know it's like all over you and it's like how how much can people endure how much financial strain can they endure and then and then it's like oh we have them and then you know the homeless crisis gets defined as a mental health crisis which in my view, you know, if you look at it through a different lens, it's not a mental health crisis. It's like people's, the financial economic pressures that are coming down on families is also generating mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so it just, sorry, I'm digressing, but. That's Thank the you. Point. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with a question or a comment? I wanted to uh, pull up uh, Zara's Paradise now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we were able to see it when I shared it before. Um, but one thing in particular, maybe that's a nice connection between these, these two elements of Dog Pound and Zara's Paradise is this idea of location, you know? that you were put in that location for Dogtown and then it took time to sort of recognize it. And then with Zara's Paradise, I thought it was interesting that you were 12 years old, was it? That you were directly across from Evan Presen. And so again, you're placed in a location and that triggers something. Um, the other thing I thought was fascinating was the way you broke the story, they say this, right, in screenwriting, you know, you started thinking about all the different places, right? All the different locations of where the story would be. So we have the, the copy place, uh, we have the taxis. So we have the sort of Kiaras dummy taxi, taxis happening in, uh, the place. Um, and then we also have uh, the leader speaking on, on the television. And then we have the blogger himself. So we are able to interweave through the narrative. And then there's this wonderful thing where as we're going through the narrative and we're in this blog, then every once in a while, you give us a little bit of a poem. You give us some hafiz. Or even when we have this mention of the crane in this image, um, you start talking about Rumi and Shams and the potential of, of love in all this grief and the you know, potential of gay love. And it's so, so subtle, all these wonderful nuances and this layering throughout. And so I don't know if there's necessarily a, a, a question there as much as an observation of location and how it's pulled you through the graphic novel, but maybe also how location is operating in Dogtown. Maybe there's some type of similarity there for you and, and, and there's a bridge in location and time between these two pieces. Wow. Well, Piruz, this is very kind of you because, you know, it's, um, I think, I think um, maybe I'm in both places. Right? Maybe as an immigrant, I can't just be in one place and not the other. And I can't find a way to be in both at the same time. And, you know, that's why I need the arts to stay sane so that I can through, through creativity, stay connected to both my worlds and not to have to make choices and have ways of being present in both and not having to just, just be American or just be Iranian. I need the hyphen in there somehow to, to let me to breathe. Um, but yeah, I do think, I do think, I think you're very right. I mean, the barber, I mean, to go back to your to throw the ball back into your court, the barber shop, right? 
location it's so powerful and then the park where you would go for walks with your father and how that took you back to Talleron took him back to Talleron I mean these evocations but I also think there's a politics that I've um, that I've embraced you know and that's uh, and it, it's funny it's like I felt it I felt it on this trip you know I came from I came from a background where I thought you know I mean I, I can be brutally honest about it where I felt you know I was a prince of Iran I was the prince of Iran it was my country my family had been there for 800 years my grandfather had given Reza Shah the title the great after he was exiled my other great grandfather was somebody you know um, we had pictures of him with the king of Iraq and this and that and the other. And so to be so unceremoniously thrown out of the country at 12, where you felt, you know, it was such a, you know, you know, it was such a shift. And then, you know, but still, you know, I went to the best of British public schools and then I came to America and I had a green card. I, in England, I had a British passport. You know, I was so, you know, so I'm in the best of British schools as the Iran-Iraq war has started and my generation is being mowed down to pieces in Iran. You know, kids, kids were being sent to the front lines and, you know, you, again, it's the conscience thing. I remember like when I was, you know, you open the newspaper and you'd see a picture of a kid who, you know, Asphyx, you know, these asphyxiated images of dead kids on the front or like a severed foot in a boot, in a boot and, you know, this kind of thing. And, you know, it's your deepest, des my deepest desire was to put, put my worlds back together again, you know, um, put these dead kids back together again. You know, you know, you know, when they, when you have a, toy that's broken and you kind of really want to put it back together again so i always wanted to put these broken things back together again and you know it's a very futile thing in a sense right because how are you going to put the dead back together again how are you going to lift them out of the ground where they're you know where they've been buried and if you don't do that then what are you if you don't witness choose to forget you know and so so you know location it's like scratch any surface of any place or country scratch the ground just a little bit and it's like thousands of years of human histories that you're walking over you know and it's just this you know we you know in some ways it's the earth is this bursting with life and yet you were, were, were you know wherever we walk you know i'm in utah right now it's like what right do i have to a title to my condo here when i know that that title makes me a participant in all the history that has resulted in this land being parceled out the way it is and you know it's just like it's overwhelming to be alive is overwhelm for me it's sometimes really overwhelming it's it's too much you know and so i think the arts are the ultimate sanctuary that i go to in order to in order to in order to confront insanity and avoid insanity as well you know it's like and, and you know you see it you see you see the grandeur and beauty of human beings on the one hand in this side of the balance. Like you see it in Jason, you, you know, in the recycling center where people had absolutely nothing. If somebody asked Miss Kay, if somebody was in trouble, somebody asked Miss Kay for something, like whatever it was, she'd just put her hand in her pocket and just give them their give them her money. And you know, like people like her can't quite adjust to this modern world that disciplines us the way it does 
you know they they're not they're not rational economic actors they're irrational economic actors because they're lovers and i kind of feel that all of us are at some level really lovers and to love is to confront the world in certain ways and to reclaim little bits and pieces of it and you, know, you look at you know what happened you know you look you know anyway you look at you look at social you know you look at these movements and how electrifying life can be when it's when it's present and so you know um i don't know i feel location and being um are very closely tied location and identity are very closely tied as well and we carry these things somehow i'm you know very curious about you know what what kesiana stories like how the locations in her lives or in dajone or servine or hong's life how these locations save us and of course homelessness is is about rejecting all these locations in some ways there's there's our darling miss k mattresses identities like right with homelessness like if you don't if you don't have a location you can't have an identity if you don't have an identity you can't get your prescriptions you can't pick up your social security check you know all of these things and yet these are all inventions they're all constructions and you know so on and so forth Piruz, you're pushing you're pushing a lot of very delicate buttons here you're <laughs> thank you i'm in i mean i i perhaps i'm in need of this conversation at this point in time no maybe we're all in need of this conversation i see uh sarvin has written something in farsi to all of us osman bor amanat natavanast kishi tell us about that sarvin Oh you were saying how living is difficult and that I think a piece of stanza of poem by Hafiz that talks about the same thing. All right I so hope that I'll get to I so hope that um you'll share my uh, peers you'll share my email with everyone and that when you've got whenever you wish to share your stories you'll grant me the privilege of being of hearing or in seeing your work exchange right all exchange i have one hard question for you again yeah. <laughs> um you said you don't see yourself as a filmmaker but as i hear you talk as i listen to your words and descriptions um i wonder if you see yourself as a poet um sometimes yeah i love language i love words i that's where i that's where i that's how i you know yeah so the answer is yeah very much so it's like if i don't have access to language um i get real i'm in serious serious trouble um and it's very it's very interesting i mean it's like you know i've been thinking a lot about breathing because the things that have been going on in the like George Floyd's words i can't breathe i can't breathe i feel as though and then you know we we look at things through these sort of different prisms but then you go back a little bit and you see alam kurdi the little syrian refugee who was face down on the sand on the shores of the mediterranean and then you see the girls in iran being poisoned and then you you know this this and then and then you know you and then and then so so with words almost as containers of breath that is passed on to us like the like what you're sharing it's like it's hafiz's breath is in those words you know and so this so this big exploration like not exploration it's like um you know i almost collapsed with what was going on in iran in the past few months i just couldn't 
bear waking up and I just couldn't bear sleeping. You know, it was this strange place where, and I just write and 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 I just couldn't stop writing. And it gets out of control. One version, second version, third version, fourth version, 15 versions of something. And these ideas are coming and connecting and, you know, the deaths, you know, the, you know, it's just back to this putting things together, trying to put things together as they're falling apart and not being able to. And, um, and it was really strange. I went to DC to pick up a prize that was being granted to Nasrin Sutude, who's an Iranian activist that I work very closely with. Um, and it was questionable whether we wanted to accept the prize or not, whatever, because I, I, I also think of myself as a human rights activist. So in the end, we went and you know I went to the State Department and they gave the prize and it was giving awards to various democracy activists around the world. And, you know, with all the highfalutin language and all of this, and I accepted it and I participated in that. In that. And the State Department itself felt like this Stalinist tomb. It just needed, you know, what is it called? Queer eye for the guy or whatever it is. It just needed a complete makeover because it was just so flat. And you, if you wanted to go to the bathroom, you need to have someone to accompany you. It was just like, oh my goodness. So anyway, I come out and it was, Feb it was a very cold February day. And, you know, I so this is my Iran part. And then I'm in the taxi and it, it was so cold that you couldn't last for two minutes outside. And I'd just been to the burn unit here in Utah because a friend had burned themselves and I'd you know, I ask questions like, why do, who are the mo people you most admit? And it's oftentimes homeless people because they freeze in the cold and they go to the, their bodies burn from the cold and then they go in for amputations and all this. And I come out and we're, I'm in a taxi again, taxi location. And as we're driving back to Georgetown or wherever it was I was staying, you see all these people sleeping outside in just like the recycling center, all the homeless all over Washington, DC in 10 degrees Fahrenheit weather. And it's just like overwhelming this knowledge that so many people are gonna be amputated the next day. Like you just know it. And you know, you could put them all in the state department that night. Like you could just open the door of the state department put aside security and just say, you know, just come and sleep here tonight. We'll make the state. So I'm a, a, accepting an award for a human rights activist in Iran and there in the nation's capital, everyone's turning a blind eye on the, you know, human rights travesty. And there are these points. So you find yourself in these like disconnects within you, within your work, within your life that you can't integrate. And I literally started couldn't breathe and my heart was racing so fast I couldn't I just didn't know what to do and I came here and I actually had to miss a trip to the Berlin Film Festival where I, a friend of mine's film was being shown because I just I just lost control over my body over my emotions over language like I just couldn't reflect what I was feeling and I think the beauty of the arts, I mean, the beauty of Pierce's film is that he insisted on going back and working through and reclaiming that feeling and connecting to that point. And I honestly think that that probably saved your own life and a lot of other lives along the way because it, it allowed it allowed for you to breathe many, many years later because we have these zones in ourselves that are asphyxiated because of the roles we have to play. And, you know, moving through that asphyxiation, I think is one of the things that the artist has to do. And that, my darling Sarveen, is why it's so damn difficult because sometimes you just don't have the energy for the for the breath to release its power and its beauty and you have to be very forgiving with yourself I feel as an artist you have to be very kind 
and you have to realize that, well, maybe that's not the, that wasn't the time. And maybe the reason I was failing all along in all these things that I was trying was because I needed to attain a deeper maturity so that when I would go to it, to that material, I could do something that would be more more beautiful. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of the art, of being an artist. It's that you're in a constant relationship with failure <laughs> rather than, you know, I got a $2 million bonus, you know, whatever it is. And that willingness to sit with failure and impotence and not generating and not producing is part of the artistic process. And again, back to Pierce's film, it's like, the openness that he has about his process as a filmmaker, that vulnerability is actually quite, it's very, it's very fun and fresh. And it's like, oh, you know, and, and just the encount, and, you know, so, so anyway, what am I saying? I, I one of us is going to have to carry the weight of the sky. And it's probably going to be you, Seraphine. <laughs> So it's not to me. Uh, I sometimes think that, you know, it's like, honestly, it's like, this is, this is my joy. I mean, he's here with me. And it's like Louis. And it's just like, oh, he's here. He's like waiting for me. He's like, he's like, you know, it's just like, I'm connected to a living being. And my goodness, isn't that, isn't that, you know, this is, like, if, oh yeah, I may not be able to generate very much, but if I do this, look at that, look at that. You know, look at that. You know, I just playing and everything. It's like, I have that. You know, I can go back to Louis. And that's kind of home too, isn't it? It's where you you just, you know, curious. You know? I mean, what more Louis is tale? Louis is tale. You know, that, like, you really do need to, you really do need to have your, the things that protect you, close to you, as close as the things that hurt you, the things that give you joy. If it's water, if it's cucumbers, if it's carrots, whatever it is, bring them close to you. Thank you. I can't wait to um, see a film or a poetry or whatever, in whatever form you capture your relationship and love for Louis. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. I think I needed to hear that <laughs> sitting with failure. I think that's something we all need to learn. Yeah, the familiar is so cool. The familiar is so beautiful. Right? It's where you can take your socks off and, you know, <laughs> take your shoes <laughs> off, not perform and not produce and not not be obliged and not, you know, it's very, the fallow spaces are so important. It's been very refreshing, everything you said. You just, you have this peace about you. And honestly, everything you said reminded me to keep telling the intricate details of humanity and to do it honestly and to take my time and to do it with empathy. Because um, it, it makes a difference and it, it really highlights the story I'm trying to tell. And thank you for sharing your journey with us. I, I know that it's not easy to talk about it. It's even go through it. And I'm I'm happy that you're going to start telling stories again because everything you said was so honest and so cinematic. And I too look forward to what you create. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I look forward to what you're going to create. I have to say, I, like, that's the thing. Like, honestly, that's the thing. It's like, I think in modern life, I think it's a function of modern life. It's time. It's such, it's such an oppressive, useless, annoying thing that we're constantly speeding past each other as people, as opposed to being present with each other. And, you know, we're finishing things. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can't imagine, like, the number of things that Dean has to that has to pass across his <laughs> desk every day, right? This issue, that funding, this payment, that fundraiser, the, you know, it's just like, oh, and 
And I think that, um, you know, I've had teachers, really my master teachers are people that I've been in conversation with for 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a fleeting thing. It's a, you know, it's, I'm in the presence of another human being and there's no, nothing greater, whoever they might be. And I want to be in their presence. And, and I think that it's that, it's that long, it's when you, when we grant each other that long time, which I think, for instance, cultures like China and Iran are very good at doing that long sense of time where, you know, I might meet you just for an instant, but it's with the awareness that our paths will cross again and again and again. When, when Dejonia, you've produced your work or when you have some other, you know, that, that, that you know, and, and I think I have had teachers who've taught me that, that, you know, that, that, you know, you, we are not, you know, and this goes back to what the Dean was saying, you know, I think academia when it's structured that your relationship with your teacher is over a course and not over a lifetime is already doing you a dis, doing everyone a disservice. Um, and when the generations are broken up in this university the way they are, again, another disservice, you know, so, uh, you know, I, you know, it's easy for me to say all these things, of course, but what I mean is that, what I mean is that I too look very much forward to your works. And I too look, just as you're encouraging me to speak of mine, I wish to be in your presence when you've completed your projects. And, you know, I, I don't want it to just, I don't want my relationships to be, you know, consumer things. Okay, we, we consume this 30 minutes, it's over, goodbye. I don't like that. I think we owe each other so much more. I think we can offer each other so much more, you know? Like Louis, I'm with Louis, I'm gonna be with Louis till I die or till, you know, and then after, you know? So, I, you know, and then, and, then, and then our presence continues, you know? I mean, I think this was, you know, when um, when Pirus goes back to the barber shop and one and the barber shop, the barber is dead, but Pirus is still in a conversation with him. You know, you know that's that for me is that Persian, if I can say this, it's a different conception of time and it's a different conception of conversation and being. And I think that's what artists do. We change each other's ideas of what it means to what it means to be so thank you yeah the intricate matters so much thank you well, that's a great encouragement for all of us when did you have your first piece of uh, um, art, uh, cinematic work like this one? Um, this was my first. This was my first cinematic. Oh, I see. Project. Okay. But I um, had the luck of meeting a Cambodian uh, mm. filmmaker named Michael Siv, and we went out on a trip. As a reporter, we went out on a trip to Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. to make a short documentary film. And I was interviewing people and he was filming. So that was really the first piece. But, you know, honestly, I think your first cinematic film, in a way, your memory is the cinema, right? It's like your the first things that you remember, the visions, the images, um, you know, and, and then they lend themselves, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, with... Honestly, if you just do a sketch, like Piru's, when you look at his film, he's got all these graphic novel images and drawings. Like once you do your first sketch, you're off, you're on your way to cinema, you know, because you're, you know, you're moving and creating 
And that's it. Like if you do if in the first sketch, the first sentence, that's the cinema, I think. Mm. And it's funny because the word for cinema, I think goes back to kina something. The etymology of it is very interesting. I think it goes back to motion, but also to kingship, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's, you know. And also I, movement, movement is cinema. Mm -hmm. Movement is cinema. You're moving your head down. That, <laughs> that's cinema. Your smile right now. It's cinema. <laughs> The sound is cinema. Your eyes are cinema. Your glasses are cinema. Oh. You know, all of that is cinema. The fact that you're buttoned up, but I also see your your undershirt. That's cinema. It's like, what would, you know, how would everything change if you were to take off your shirt? You know, <laughs> like that cinema. And what would you look like if you moved your took your glasses off? That cinema. It's like everything is like our attention to each other is cinema. I think. Mm. Way. And also, it's amazing. And um, you uh, use two different and uh, type of medium to communicate. One is a book. Another is um, a documentary to communicate to convey some very powerful message. So, how did you uh, choose the different types of medium to do this? I think this goes back to what um, Sarveen was saying. I think. Mm -hmm. I think there's this tendency to think of ourselves as one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that I'm a poet. I'm a journalist. I'm a filmmaker. I am an academic. And, and yet, in a way, we're all of those if we allow ourselves to be, right? And then every, I also think that every story suggests its own medium, you mm -hmm. know? Like, like, um, like I couldn't have done Zahra's Paradise in another way because I had no way of entering Evin prison and filming inside Evin prison. Or I had no way of filming 3 million people. I didn't have the budget for 3 million people walking down the th streets mm -hmm. of Tehran and me filming it. Um, I didn't have... So, so, so the constraints sometimes also force you to choose your medium, mm. you know? And and that's sometimes a really wonderful thing because, you know, a graphic novel is a very cheap and fast thing to do. You All you really need is a pencil. And an, I always say, all you really need is a pencil and an imagination. Whereas film, it's light, sound, presence, location, you know, all of those things make it, make it very, give it an immediacy but mm -hmm. to capture that immediacy, you need an infrastructure that's not about immediacy. And then I think there's a, another dimension. Um, Piers John, I'm I assume that you will you're you will let us know when the conversation, whatever that I don't mean to be pushing your time limits, or I do. I'm I'm here with you. Okay. So until until we reach the the end uh, of the uh, thirty birds, we're here. Okay, so, um, so you know, it's like when you're making a film, it's very interesting. You think you're making a film, but as you're making the film, you have to learn all these other things, hmm. like bookkeeping, like grant writing, like um, getting permissions, like you know these, you know the, and and so before you know it, the last thing you are is a filmmaker. And you're all these other things, right? And then you have to like beg someone, you know, cinematographer sick, and you know, you know, then you have, you know, it's like, and then you've got, to, you know, then you get, you know, your car and the camera gets stolen, and you know, it, it's just like you're, you know, it's like that. It's like that. So so you, you know, I think the ultimate thing is that you've got to be willing to pay the price of what you want to create. Um, I think that's the basic. And if you have to do bookkeeping, you know, and here's the beauty of it. You don't have to do the bookkeeping. Like you don't have to do the filming. You just have to put the pieces together. And then it's much less overwhelming. 
you know, because nobody, even Steven Spielberg, can't do everything himself. And I think great filmmakers like Pirus, who like were born natural born filmmakers, like they just had it in them from high school. For them, it's just a you know, it's like tying their shoelace. But for those of us who come to it a little bit later, like myself. Oh my goodness, I was so intimidated by it. I was so intimidated by the camera, by every single button on the camera. And I can't tell you how many interviews I made where, you know, like there was water coming down the gutter. And it mm -hmm. and I had I thought I had the best audio. And then when you listen to it in reality, it's like, oh damn, I had audio coming. Or you go to make another film with Miss K. We did we had this film where She's crying and there's some music in the background. I didn't know anything about music rights in film. And then when I came to like, when Independent Lens came and said, we, are, we want to buy your film, then I had to have permission. I had to find out what the damn song was, who had the rights to it, and like how much of my blood they wanted in exchange for like 30 mm -hmm. seconds of a song. And... So now I I'm a little bit more experienced, just a little bit more experienced. But what I want to say is that, like, I had also I hadn't made a graphic novel, but a friend of mine whom I loved had made it, and I loved him enough to feel that we're so close and so similar that okay I could do it too. I swear to God, all of you are graphic novelists and filmmakers and poets and, you know. Like all of us are all of these things. It's just a question of which we choose to give how much time and attention to. Great points. Thank you. I'm looking forward to what you're going to write. I'm looking forward to your graphic. <laughs> <novel>. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, thank you so much. I think that this is a good point for us to stop. I don't want to take any more of your time. You know, it's been so wonderful to have you here with us. So many wonderful things you touched on. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, everyone uh, will join me in thanking you, being very grateful for your generosity, for your love, for what you're doing with all your work, your kindness. And we are all looking forward to the stories that you're going to tell. And Goodness. I look forward so much to all my students and the dean sharing their stories with you. Thank you so very much. I, I so appreciate this myself as well. And um, yeah, couldn't have asked for more. And you're the ones who've given me your time. So I'm also very grateful for that and um, wish you all love in the world. Mm -hmm. much love much yeah. love to all of you and uh, for those of you that want to talk to me later and have questions about the films that you're creating now um, I'll log off for five minutes so the video can load and record on the computer and then I'll log back on on the same link and we can talk about your individual issues Okay. thank you very much Piru, thank you Sarah thank you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Call me home. And we thank you yeah. all as well. And till till next time. Until next time. Thank and uh, thank you, Peru. And good to see you, everyone. Thank you, Jin Chen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have a good evening and a good summer. Yeah. See you yeah. all soon. Mm -hmm.